Okay, so moving on, we're moving farther north in North America to talk about Canada, Canadian forests and boreal forests today. So quickly, before we get started, today's tree trivia, what is considered to be the largest tree on earth? So the answer to that depends on how you measure it, right? So quaking aspen, populus tremuloides, which you'll learn in lab, grows clonally. And um, there's a famous quaking aspen called pando, which covers 100 acres. And it's a clone, right? So genetically identical trees that grow in the Fish Lake National Forest in Utah. So as many as 47,000 stems have been counted on what amounts to be, right, so they're considering this to be a single tree because it's clonal. Now if you only measure a single trunk as a tree, you would have a different answer for that. So boreal forests um, are found around the globe, right, so the ones we're going to talk about here are in North America, but they are found between 50 and 70 degrees north latitude where there's plenty of rainfall. These forests are characterized by temperature extremes and they are largely forested. So a third of the worldwide forest area is found in this type of boreal forest. And as you go from the north, right, of, you know, no trees, right, we start with tundra with just a few scattered trees. And then as you work your way um, into the more southern latitudes, you'll end up with a closed canopy evergreen forest, right? So these forests have a short growing season, but the, since they're evergreen, they can photosynthesize year round. And then once you get into the lowest um, latitudes, you'll have um, mixed conifer and deciduous forests. So what are the primary environmental factors here? So for this set of lectures, I borrowed um, information from the Natural Resources Division in Canada. Um, and so, of course, the Canadians rec recognize many more forest types than we'll have time to delve into today, but, um, but they're here in case you're interested in them. And they have different names for their forest types and what we have. So they recognize three different types of boreal forests where we will kind of group those all into one. So environmentally, these are characterized by cool summers, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, very cold winters, minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, there are not very many species that can tolerate those kinds of conditions. Um, it also is a maybe surprising to you drier um, forest, right? So average annual rainfall is 15 to 30 inches a year, right? With that being more wet in the maritime provinces, um, certainly a lot more wet, 40 to 90 degree to 90 inches of annual rainfall, depending on where you are in the Pacific Northwest. And then up in the tundra, this is actually very dry. So um, in addition to having very cold temperatures, it's also very dry, which limits um, the growth of trees. Glaciation is also a huge factor here. So youthful topography is what that results in. And we'll talk about glaciation a little bit more through the lens of um, my time as a student conservation association intern in Chugach National Forest, Alaska. So glaciation, results in the same sort of landscape. Um, but so I'm gonna talk about in the context of Alaska, even though today we're mostly looking at boreal forests in Canada and other parts of North America. So if you ever have a chance to be an SCA intern, I highly recommend it. I still tell people it's one of the best summers of my life. And you can see this landscape is shaped by frozen ice. So where I worked, this is the view out the visitor center window from where I worked for a whole summer. There's a glacier tucked in here. These are rivers of ice. And so as they recede, they tend to, as they move, they tend to carve out landscapes. So instead of very steep sided, um, deeply cut basins, like you would expect with water, ice tends to hollow and smooth things out. So you can see it results in these U-shaped valleys. And um, Portage Glacier is where I worked. Um, and this series of photos is from 1914 to 2019. So you can see the glacier has receded um, really significantly since that time. When I worked at Chugach, you could still see um, the ice was still at the end of the lake, um, but now it's retreated up into that valley. So features of a glaciated landscape, here's our re retreating glacier, right? So it's just a big thick layer of ice. And so it leaves things behind that are very recognizable once you know. So glaciers, you can see the dark stripes on the glacier photos and the pictures. Um, carry, they carry rock and debris with them. It freezes into the ice as they travel extremely slowly. 
And then they tend to leave these moraines. So this is just piles of rubble um, from where the glacier stopped advancing and started to recede. So you can see um, a little bit of a moraine forming here um, in the 2006 photo. And then these landscapes also tend to have lots of lakes that are left by chunks of ice that are left melting, right? These are called kettle lakes. And then they also importantly leave this outwash plain. So they tend to leave things as they recede, very like kind of dry rocky gravel, very nutrient poor, there's really no soil. Um, and so that's another um, feature of a glaciated landscape. It just has very coarse rocky soil that's not um, very nutrient rich. And so when you've got a glacier that recedes, right, you're starting with rock. So there's no seabed, there's no soil. And over time, right, we talked a little bit in the last lecture about primary succession. So this is young topography, no soil, no seed bank. So these glacial outwash in the soils are very infertile and very, very rocky. So very hard for any kind of plants to get a foothold. So it starts with lichens and mosses that are able to sprout on top of rocks. And um, they often will, they're called rock breaks sometimes, right? So plants that fill into these little holes um, and places with tiny bits of soil will grow in. And that paves the way for some other small plants. Often there are nitrogen fixing plants that help make that soil more fertile. So they're often in the early successional stages here. Um, and then, you know, as the soil develops, you get more and more plants. And so in Alaska, where I was, that looked like willow and alder, which is in the glacial outwash plains that eventually gave way to um, a forested canopy. If you have secondary succession, like we talked about in the Piedmont, you already start with the seed bank and seeds. So you don't have this, this period of rocks and lichens and mosses. It's a very, very long time period. It takes a long time for that to break down. Another feature of um, glaciation is that you have loads of lakes in these regions. And if you ever zoom in on Google Earth, you'll see just how many lakes are in this region. So let's talk about um, Canada and the boreal forest. So 35% of Canada's land area is forested. And that might surprise you. You might think that there's more, but out in the, um, you know, there's a lot of tundra, right? So a lot of northern forested area that way. And then some areas where there's grasslands, right? So here, this is kind of an extension of the upper Midwest, you know, too dry for trees there. And in Canada, interestingly, this is really important for management, 90% of the forests are publicly owned. So forestry is an incredibly important industry in Canada, 1.4 billion, that's 2017 numbers, exports and primary wood products. And then um, $17.5 billion exports in pulp and paper products, right? So big paper industry in Canada. Um, and then also, thirdly, $3.6 million worth of exports in maple products. So 32 billion liters of syrup. So when I told you that it takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup, do a little numbers there to see how many gallons of um, sap were harvested to produce 32 billion liters of syrup. So this is again figures from the Canadian Natural Resources Council. So how much of Canada's forest, right? So we have 35%. Right, this green area blown out looks at the forest ownership, right? And you can see most of it is um, owned by provincial governments, right? So publicly owned forest, another chunk owned by the territories. Um, private land, very different from the United States. Only 6.2% is owned by private landowners. Only 2% can, um, still owned by indigenous people or First Nations as they're called in Canada. And then you've got some owned by the federal government, municipalities, and other. Um, so here's just some interesting um, stats on Canada. Their forest products industry is quite different. Um, you can see forest types. 68% of our forest types in Canada are coniferous. Then you've got mixed, right? Mixed coniferous and um, broadleaf forest. Broadleaf forest or deciduous forest, 11%. And then they call it temporarily non-treed, 6%. Um, and, you know, forests are really important to Canada's biodiversity with two thirds of all species in Canada found in forest ecosystems. And then sustainability is very important and prominent in the Canadian forest products industry. So uh, nearly half were certified to third party standards for sustainable forest management. 
Um, and then looking at disturbance, right? So some of these should be familiar to you and we'll watch this video on play posit. Um, large area impacted by insects, fire, um, right? And I think this is graphic if I know my marketing well, um, understanding that, you know, not that much of it is harvested, right? So compared to forests that were burned or impacted by insects um, and deforested. So insects are a big issue. So in the Canada boreal forest region, when we talk about boreal, we mean northern, right? So that's a gen that that's what boreal means. It means northern. And we have um, three different types of forests that we'll talk about in this lecture. So spruce fir forests, which will look familiar to you, um, bog forests, which will not look familiar to you, and then a glacial outwash plain. This little plant here is um, Clintonia borealis which um, is a really pretty little wildflower that I saw when I was in Canada. And you'll see that a lot of these forests are evergreen. So, and that's shown here in this photo, you can see most of the crowns are very pointed. They're very deep green, um, indicating that they're coniferous forests. So, right, and this is just a type of spruce fir forest with the trees much larger than they are in North Carolina. Those principal species, no surprise, are spruce and fir. And so in the eastern part of North America, we have red spruce, Picea rubens, which you know. And then central um, part of this boreal forest are white spruce, Picea glauca. And then fir, the fir we have in Canada is the balsam fir, Aedes balsamia. And then there's paper birch is another component, a deciduous early successional um, tree that, that is part of the early succession of these forest types. You'll see these crowns are extremely tapered, right? So they have to deal with huge amounts of snow. And so those um, long branches are pruned off with snow and ice. And so they retain these very, very skinny crowns. So this forest structure, right? Let's talk about how you recognize those. If you're looking at that photo on the right, it's a very even age stand. So these are forests that regenerate after a catastrophic disturbance of some kind, right? So the forest entirely regenerates. Um, and that could be fire, insects, or disease that wipes out swaths of forest. You can see a big section here. I think that's insect disease that has killed that section of forest, but it will regenerate. Um, before colonization, um, it was thought that the disturbance interval was 75 to 100 years. Compare that to the 100 to 300 years that we think is common for New England. And then these openings have lots of wildflowers and herbaceous species. So they're just part of the forest ecosystem early on um, after following disturbance. It's an opening for um, wildflowers and other space herbaceous species to get started. This flower you may know here, this is Calmia, used to be Latifolia, um, I think now Carolina. So this is sheep kill, um, it's, it's related to mountain laurel. So you know red spruce, Picea rubens, you should recognize that cone immediately with its kind of rounded cone scales, right? And you can see that it is in North Carolina and the Southern Appalachians and then ranges north. So in North Carolina, it's only found above about 5,000 feet, but obviously this is much lower elevation the farther north you go. It is susceptible to spruce budworm, so that's one threat to it. And then, like I said, as you move farther west, you'll, the main species is Picea glauca. And so those needles kind of look a little bit frosted. The cones look pretty familiar, but they look a little bit larger than red spruce. So it's got this frosted appearance or glaucus, like it's waxy. And this species actually goes all the way up to the tree line, climatic tree line. Um, it's Canada's northernmost spruce. So if you find a spruce and you're visiting, probably it's that one. Um, and it tends to favor dry habitats. So this is a legitimate canopy species. It grows quite tall. On the fur end of things, so in the Southern Appalachians, we have our own Fraser fir, right? Southern Appalachian endemic. So you can see this fur is absent here. This is balsam fir, Aedes balsamia. And you should know immediately that this is a fir, right? Because it looks like a fir. And so part of the exciting thing about dendrology is you can travel elsewhere in the world and have a general sense of what a species might be, either the family or the genus. And so you can see these cones look very much like Fraser fir. They're perched upright on the branches. The foliage looks like 
fur as well, right? It's blunt and soft. So this is a species that's grown for Christmas trees, but it has relatively low timber value. And then finally, the early successional species, paper or white birch, Betula papifera, um, important pioneer species. You can see it's regenerated here at the edge of this forest. It does have some commercial value um, in veneer, plywood, furniture, and pulpwood. And <clears throat> although it's not shown on the map here, it does extend into the Southern Appalachians. There's a small stand of it found at Mount Mitchell. And if you look at the leaves, it might look familiar to you, a little bit like river birch, but the leaf base, instead of being cuneate or wedge-shaped, is either truncate or slightly heart-shaped. And then, of course, the bark is bright white, which is a real giveaway. So moving on, so this is an environment and landscape that we don't have in North Carolina. I can see these kind of soggy lakes ringed with trees. Um, so this is a bog forest. Um, and bogs are wet depressions in the Northeast and Canada. They were formed when blocks of ice from glaciers melted into a little depression to make lakes. And the prim primary species in these areas is black spruce and larch or tamarack. So Picea mariana and Larix laricina. You might recall from our lecture on gymnosperms that larch is one of the few gymnosperms that is deciduous. And so these beautiful yellow conical trees are larch, um, larch Larix laricina in this case. We'll learn another larch at a later lecture. Um, and so these species have to deal with restricted drainage and deep organic peat soils. So that means these soils are very acidic and tend to be nutrient poor. Um, so all those nutrients are tied up in those organic key compounds. And you may have heard of a term called quaking bog. And that's when, um, that has to do with bog origins. I think I have a, yeah, this is great. So these bog forests, right? So first they start as open water and there's lakes. If you go on Google Maps, you can see lakes all over this region. And eventually, right, they start accumulating sediment, right? So leaves and other organic material falls in and sinks to the bottom. These are very, very cold environments. And so, and they're pretty much anaerobic. So this organic material can accumulate and it really doesn't ever break down. So it just forms this deep peaty soil. And so eventually that fills and these habitats are still extremely wet um, and swampy but vegetation can eventually grow across it. And so a quaking bog could be where the trees are all kind of crooked because the root systems are essentially on an old lake bed that is still pretty wet. One of the important plants of these places is sphagnum, right? So these are peat. These are peat plants, the sphagnum moss. Um, there are many, many different species of those. And we think these are a really important carbon sink, right? So it accumulates all these organic sediments and ties up that carbon for the long term. Sphagnum also has commercial value as sphagnum moss, which you can buy in the store. So really um, popular soil additive because it's like a sponge, it can retain moisture. And so it's a good thing to mix into your soil if you wanna improve soil moisture and texture. Um, just looking quickly at the species here, we have black spruce, Picea mariana, right, also called bog spruce or swamp spruce. It is pretty similar to white spruce, so it might be hard for you to recognize at first. The um, needles are a bit shorter and the cones a little bit more rounded. This is an important timber species in Canada, and earlier I had a point of when do you think you can harvest these kinds of forests? Well, right, probably in the summer when they're not or I'm sorry, probably in the winter when the ground is frozen, you can actually get equipment in to harvest those trees. So this is an important timber species in Canada and they favor wet habitats as well as organic soils. And then looking at the larch, right? This is a truly beautiful tree. American larch or tamarack, Larix laricina, also favors bobcat habitats. And this is the species you'll see co-occurring with black spruce, Picea mariana. Um, the needles are born on short shoots. This might remind you a little bit of cedrus um, deodora if we've learned that in lab. So the, the needles are in clusters on these short shoots and then they have these um, cute little flat scale cone shapes. Um, this just shows just the huge amount of lake habitat, right? So this is Manitoba and Ontario. And just looking at all these um, 
all these little lakes that can produce these types of bog forests. So there's quite a bit of habitat for those there. So lastly, we're gonna talk about glacial outwash plains. This is what one looks like. So you can see the glacier here is receding up. It, there's a river of ice that comes down from these mountains. Um, this is, you know, I talked, taught the glaciation, it was the first environmental education I did um, when I worked for the Student Conservation Association. And as this glacier has retreated, it's left this wash, you know, kind of coarse soil and gravel. Um, it's fairly wet, it's got some streams coming through it. Now look, let's look at the forest types that grow there. So these glacial outwash plains are formed when um, glacial sediments are deposited by water that's melting off the glacier. And so you can see a kind of a cross section here. You've got some ice blocks, sometimes they make little kettle lakes, but this outwash plain is a very common feature um, of these types of environments and of this region. Um, the fire cycle is important here. It releases soil, um, nutrients that may be st stored in organic soil, and um, also reduces and knocks back competition. And these are very well-drained sites, so they are subject to droughts. This is what these forests look like. You have principal species of jack pine um, on the driest site, which is Pinus banksiana, and then red pine, and also quaking aspen, populus terminoides. And then on the moisture sites, it grades into white pine, Pinus strobus. And often this is a great place to look for blueberries, so vaccinium. Um, looking at jack pine, this is a fire adapted species and you can see its range here up mostly into Canada, but also the Great Lakes. We talked about a little in the last lecture. 50 to 80 year fire cycle, you can see these are serotonous cones that are very um, distinctly curved and they curved inward towards the tips of the branches. So this is also precocious, right? So this tree starts producing cones at ages three and four. Um, so it produces cones very early because the fire cycle is short. And it has thin bark and retains branches. So those are ladder fuels, right? This is a species um, whose fire strategy is regeneration, right? So these trees go up in flames and then that prepares the soil bed for regeneration as a scraggly form with those retained branches. This is what some of these look like. Here's the vaccinium, right? So the blueberries and the understory. You can see these scraggly trees and definitely these um, little branches that are gonna pull fire up into the canopies. Red pine is the other species that's um, common on these glacial outwash plains, Pinus resinosa. Um, it's only found in the southern part of the region, so it really doesn't venture up into Canada very much. Often co-occurs with white pine um, and it's a commercially valued species. So it's a tall species, straight trunked, um, it self prunes and has thick bark, so it's fire resistant and generally grows in more mesic or moist um, conditions. So I have to put in a, a quick um, gratuitous animal photo, right? So moose are very common in these kinds of outwash plains. They like grazing the willow. Um, and the last species I'm gonna talk about is quaking aspen, populus tremuloides which forms these beautiful yellow stands. Um, these are also clonal species, as I mentioned at the early part of the lecture. Um, this is probably the widest distributed tree in North America. So a little surprising since it's not found in the Northeast. Um, and commercially it's used for pulpwood. It is not fire tolerant. So it's an early successional species, grows clonally. So it can actually capture a site and stay in that site for a long period of time. But if fire gets into it, it has very thin, thin bark. And so it, it is not, will not survive fire. <clears throat> some of the threats to these forests, um, some of these are ones we've already discussed um, that are applicable to other forest types, things like deforestation and development. These are not really an issue in these boreal forests. These are less populated areas. Um, so some of the human disturbance is something that we don't encounter here in these boreal forests. However, climate is really moving species around um, and also it allows invasive insects to remain over the winter. And so we have more frequent insect outbreaks as the climate warms. We're also seeing incidences of much more frequent and intense wildfires um, that, you know, since these are carbon storage um, habitats, it could release massive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And you can see is the devastation from this wildfire here 
And so I'm just gonna wrap up, right? So I want you to know that boreal forests are found all around the world in the circumpolar regions. And um, Canada specifically is about a little more than a third forested. And they're very much a part of the Canadian culture, um, certainly indigenous culture, the economy, as well as the history. And we have boreal forests that's comprised of spruce and fir, so it's familiar forest type to you. The bogs that grow over um, lakes and they are um, comprised of black spruce and larch. And then we have our glacial outwash plains, which contain kind of a mix of species depending on where you are in the region. But some of the drier forest sites are fire adapted and have fire adapted species. And so I think you've seen um, throughout this lecture in the past one, the fire is a natural part of these ecosystems, but we are definitely seeing an increase in more frequent and more intense wildfires. And these definitely pose a threat to the human communities, as well as um, being a threat to these as carbon sinks. And so that's all I have for this lecture. We're going to move farther west in our next lecture.